What I want to do is uh, tell you a little bit about what we are doing in our organization, EIT Digital, and then focus mainly on the startup scene in Europe, how it is characterized and what we are doing to fuel it. It's actually, <coughs> we have been around now for uh, about six years, and we have quite recently, under the leadership of our Chief Strategy Officer, Sharp Nasta, who is also in the audience here, sharpened our strategy. And we have decided to really focus on a very limited number of areas. And these are the four that we have decided to go for. Digital industry, the digitization of the industry in Europe is a very important topic. That's why we took that as a central one. Digital cities, I mean, urbanization, all kind of challenges you have in the cities that you can address with digital technology, mobility, information sharing, but also tourism. Digital well-being, of course, uh, focusing really on prevention rather than on cure. And digital infrastructure, which is an integrated approach towards network, data management, and security technology in cyberspace. So that's really where our focus is, and that's also our mission. Help the European industry and the European entrepreneurs to really bring innovations in these areas. But actually what you could say is our organization is more or less an organization that's really focused on human capital development. It's really about developing the generation of innovators and entrepreneurs that Europe needs to drive it. And what we show here is a picture of one of our education, one of our schools that we have to drive the human capital agenda, and that's a master school. Because our activities are actually twofold. We deliver entrepreneurial education and we support innovation and entrepreneurship. And our approach to education is a blended approach. A blended approach where on the one hand, we blend different delivery platforms like our partner universities, like our own so-called co-location centers where we bring people together and also online platforms. And at the same time, it's blending in the sense that we combine in our schools technical knowledge with entrepreneurship skills. The schools have been active for a couple of years now and you see a growing intake and delivery on students. So by 2017, we're more or less the largest master program in digital technology in Europe. When it comes to innovation, we started with really focusing on incubation, but we very quickly discovered that the real need in Europe is not so much on incubation, which happens a lot, which also happens a lot at a local basis, a fairly local activity, but really what is needed is scaling up. So what you see is that we gradually shift our focus away from the early startups to really the early scale-ups. And the gap that we want to address is really the scale-ups that are in a financing need between, let's say, three to 10 uh, million. And you see in the, in the charts that we are having that we are steadily developing our accelerator in that direction, also delivering on that. And you see quite significant growth in the revenue, the average value, valuation of our companies, but also the size of the companies that we are supporting now. And that brings me a little bit to, if you look in Europe, you see that the situation around scale-ups is different from what you see in the US. And I took a couple of slides from a study by GP Bullhound, where they characterized the European innovation scheme. And they do that by looking back to a number of unicorns that Europe delivered. So if you look at the current situation according to their counting and their studies, there's around 50 of these unicorns in Europe. And you see 
that most of them focus on consumer applications, while there is a small group focusing on enterprise education applications. You also see what the average valuation is and the return on investment. And you also see that it's still a growing community. Yeah? In 2016, 10 entered, three went out. So there is a net growth. And these are the names of those unicorns from Europe we're talking about. Yeah? And this is just uh, the top of the list. I didn't put them all. But you see the familiar names uh, popping up there. The thing that is interesting to look at, if you look at capital raise of unicorns in Europe and you compare that to the US, then first of all you see that the average capital raised in Europe is lower than the average capital raised in the US, actually a factor of two uh, difference between the two. And you also see that the amount of money raised is in the US, it's, it's really a huge percentage, 45%, is really raising large amount of money, over 300 million in capital, while in Europe that's a much smaller percentage. So it's interesting to reflect a little bit why this is the case and what does it mean. The other thing what is, uh, is interesting is to see how long does it take to become a unicorn on average. And see there is a difference between those companies that really operate in the consumer market as opposed to those that operate in the business-to-business -business market. And so the business-to-business -business market is a tougher one. Uh, you also see that investors are keener on investing in consumer-focused unicorns rather than in business one. You see that they were able to raise much more capital to fuel. Of course, it's nice that you are able to raise a lot of money, but I always say there is money and there is real money, and the real money is, of course, the revenues you get from your customer base. If you look at the amount of profitable unicorns, you see that slightly more than half, 60% of the unicorns is profitable, so that means that still 40% of the unicorns is not profitable. And there can be a variety of reasons for that. Very often you see that the reason why there is no profitability is that there's an enormous investment in growth, which consumes a lot of money. Something which is also nice to look at is the revenue multiple. You see that the revenue multiple in the US is much, much higher than in Europe. You also see that the average revenue in Europe of the unicorns is much higher than the average revenue in the US. So if you look at those pictures, the message I would like to bring across is that Europe is as much an environment where you can bring unicorns to life as is Silicon Valley. It's maybe more spread over the continent, but I think especially also information and communication technology has made it able to connect the hubs that exist in Europe in terms of investment hubs. We heard this uh, Tim uh, telling us this morning that uh, he was able to sign from the US a, a contract uh, in Estonia uh, just by digital signature. So you see that where there is, of course, the advantage of being physically co-located in a smaller area like you are here in Silicon Valley, that is less and less relevant if you see these networks of ecosystems popping up and modern technology supporting transactions taking place in those networks without always needing to be physically present. What I want to do, I want to show you one example of a scale-up that we are building and this is called Fit to Perform. I don't know how good your Dutch is, uh, but what you see there is that truck drivers that are tired are still the cause of a lot of accidents. And this is one of the examples of those accidents. And what we actually did is we started a project that is trying to address this by a continuous monitoring of truck drivers. And if you look 
at being a truck driver is not a very healthy uh, profession. Uh, truck drivers are very often obese. They have a very stressed uh, life. And only few of them make it till the retirement age because most of them have to give up much earlier. And there's a strong correlation between healthy truck drivers and the societal impact of accidents and economic damage that it causes. So what I like about this example is that it, it really tightly integrates economic and societal benefits and direct health benefits for the driver in a kind of triangle where you can work on the one hand on the quality of life of the driver, of the societal impact on road safety, and at the same time also on the profit margin of the fleet management systems of truck companies and transportation companies. And actually what is the underlying technology is actually focusing on three key elements. One is unique sensor technology. There's a lot of sensor technology around, but there are very few sensors that deliver good enough signals to really be able to monitor the condition of a driver, whether he is really fit to perform. And we developed those sensors together with our technology partners, and these sensors are developed in the whole center in the Netherlands, together with IMEC from uh, Belgium and TNO, the research from uh, the Netherlands. And those are unique in the world, and there are no sensors around that are as precise in measuring the vital body signals that are needed to give a very precise estimate of the fitness of the driver. I think that's very important to understand. So that's one technology base. The other technology basis is the algorithms that derive from these body signals a precise assessment. So that's the whole data analytics, that's it. And then the third key element is that we build a concrete strategy via fleet management companies into the market. And you see some examples of current pilots that are going on. And one of the piloting, for example, is the continuous monitoring of a driver while driving from <laughs> a part there in, the, uh, in Germany, uh, where you see continuously how the stress levels and the condition of the driver is based on traffic situations, where you have roadworks, you have a hilly area, you have a filling station, and so on. And you can monitor that. And actually what we deliver here is what I would call the tachograph of the future. It's no longer a paper sheet which says, oh, you've been driving for four hours, so you're very fit to perform another four hours because eight is what we think a reasonable time. No, it says the morning, hey, wait a minute, you did not sleep very well. We do not know for what reasons, but you're not in a condition to start your drive uh, at this moment. As a final thing, what I would like to address a little bit is the whole issue of digital transformation and social transformation. So we saw a very good example of how technology can have multiple benefits. It can address a societal problem, a health problem, and an economic problem in one go based on very strong technology. And these kinds of innovations normally enter relatively easily new areas. At the same time, we also see that certain technical transformations that are fairly disruptive may lead to a lot of opposition. I think we had a discussion around uh, Uber here. We see the discussions around uh, Airbnb. And there are other examples where you see that the technical transformation does not go hand in hand with the social transformation, does not go hand in hand with the transformation of the regulation and the political environment that is needed to make those new technologies 
enter the society. And I think in all honesty, of course, we as innovators are always very enthusiastic about what our technology brings for new challenges. At the same time, I would make a plea for having in a much earlier development of business models around these technologies and looking at the social and societal implications of those business models, <coughs> of that much earlier in the development in order to avoid a very strong confrontation when the technology needs to be brought into the society. And of course you can say, yeah, but innovation by definition meets resistance. That's true. But I think there is a difference between in a smooth way and in a more inclusive way avoiding the resistance and taking it into account than rather to try to break it through through opposition because in the end that delays the introduction of te new technology even more. And maybe that's something where the European culture is different from a culture you find here. In Europe, you see that especially this balance between a technological transformation and a social transformation is seen as an important ingredient. And if there is a disturbance of that balance, you see a lot of resistance popping up and you see a lot of friction entering into the discussion and that sometimes emotion overtakes rationale. But I think that can be avoided and that's something where building a bridge between technology development on the one hand and more a social dialogue about what the consequences of these technologies are for society but also for individuals is something that should be more emphasized when we develop our innovations. That's it.